The following is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit www.librivox.org. This reading is by the soon-to-be world-famous Vinnie Bove. Visit Vinnie at www.boveart.com. And now, on with the show. A Journey into the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 1 The Professor and His Family On the 24th of May, 1863, my uncle, Professor Liedenbrock, rushed into his little house, number 19 Königstrasse, one of the oldest streets in the oldest portion of the city of Hamburg. Martha must have concluded that she was very much behind hand, for the dinner had only just been put into the oven. Well now, said I to myself, if that most impatient of men is hungry, what a disturbance he will make. Em Liedenbrock so soon, cried poor Martha in great alarm, half opening the dining room door. Yes, Martha, but very likely the dinner is not half cooked, for it is not two yet. St. Michael's clock has only just struck half past one. Then why has the master come home so soon? Perhaps he will tell us that himself. Here he is, Monsieur Axel. I will run and hide myself while you argue with him and Martha retreated in safety into her own dominions. I was left alone, but how was it possible for a man of my undecided turn of mind to argue successfully with so irascible a person as the professor? With this persuasion I was hurrying away to my own little retreat upstairs, when the street door creaked upon its hinges, heavy feet made the whole flight of stairs to shake, and the master of the house, passing rapidly through the dining room, threw himself in haste into his own sanctum. But on his rapid way he had found time to fling his hazel stick into a corner, his rough broad brim upon the table, and these few emphatic words at his nephew, Axel, follow me! I had scarcely had time to move when the professor was again shouting after me, What? Not come yet? And I rushed into my redoubtable master's study. Otto Liedenbrock had no mischief in him, I willingly allow that. But unless he very considerably changes as he grows older, at the end he will be a most original character. He was a professor at the Ohanim, and was delivering a series of lectures on mineralogy, in the course of every one of which he broke into a passion once or twice at least, not at all that he was over-anxious about the improvement of his class, or about the degree of attention with which they listened to him, or the success which might eventually crown his labors. Such little matters of detail never troubled him much. His teaching was, as the German philosophy calls it, subjective. It was to benefit himself, not others. He was a learned egotist. He was a well of science, and the pulleys worked uneasily when you wanted to draw anything out of it. In a word, he was a learned miser. Germany has not a few professors of this sort. To his misfortune, my uncle was not gifted with the sufficiently rapid utterance, not, to be sure, when he was talking at home, but certainly in his public delivery. This is a want much to be deplored in a speaker, the fact is that during the course of his lectures at the Ohanim, the professor often came to a complete standstill. He fought with willful words that refused to pass his struggling lips, such words as resist and distend the cheeks, and at last break out into the unasked-for shape of a round and most unscientific oath. Then his fury would gradually abate. Now, in mineralogy, there are many half-Greek and half-Latin terms, very hard to articulate, and which would be most trying to a poet's measures. I don't wish to say a word against so respectable a science, far be that from me. True, in the august presence of rhombohedral crystals, retinasphaltic resins, galenites, phaseites, molybdenites, tongue states of manganese, and titanite of zirconium, why, <laughs> the most facile of tongues may make a slip now and then. It therefore happened that this venial fault of my uncle's came to be pretty well understood in time, and an unfair advantage was taken of it. The students laid wait for him in dangerous places, and when he began to stumble, loud was the laughter, which is not in good taste, not even in Germans. And if there was always a full audience to honor the Liedenbrock courses, I should be sorry to conjecture how many came to make merry at my uncle's expense. Nevertheless, my good uncle was a man of deep learning, a fact I am most anxious to assert and reassert. 
Sometimes he might irretrievably injure a specimen by his too great ardor in handling it. But still, he united the genius of a true geologist with the keen eye of the mineralogist. Armed with his hammer, his steel pointer, his magnetic needles, his blowpipe, and his bottle of nitric acid, he was a powerful man of science. He would refer any mineral to its proper place among the 600 elementary substances now enumerated by its fracture, its appearance, its hardness, its fusibility, its sonorousness, its smell, and its taste. The name of Liedenbrock was honorably mentioned in colleges and learned societies. Humphrey Davy, Humboldt, Captain Sir John Franklin, General Sabine never failed to call upon him on their way through Hamburg. Becquerel, Ebelman, Brewster, Dumas, Milne Edwards, St. Clair de Ville frequently consulted him upon the most difficult problems in chemistry, a science which was indebted to him for considerable discoveries, for in 1853 there had appeared at Leipzig an imposing folio by Otto Liedenbrock entitled A Treatise Upon Transcendental Chemistry, with plates, a work, however, which failed to cover its expenses. To all these titles to honor, let me add that my uncle was the curator of the Museum of Mineralogy formed by M. Struve, the Russian ambassador, a most valuable collection, the fame of which is European. Such was the gentleman who addressed me in that impetuous manner. Fancy a tall spare man, of an iron constitution, and with a fair complexion which took off a good ten years from the fifty he must own to. His restless eyes were in incessant motion behind his full-size spectacles. His long, thin nose was like a knife blade. Boys had been heard to remark that that organ was magnetized and attracted iron filings. But this was merely a mischievous report. It had no attraction except for snuff, which it seemed to draw to itself in great quantities. When I have added, to complete my portrait, that my uncle walked by mathematical strides of a yard and a half, and that in walking he kept his fists firmly closed, a sure sign of an irritable temperament, I think I shall have said enough to disenchant any one who should by mistake have coveted much of his company. He lived in his own little house in Konigstrasse, a structure half brick and half wood, with a gable cut into steps, it looked upon one of those winding canals which intersect each other in the middle of the ancient quarter of Hamburg, and which the great fire of 1842 had fortunately spared. It is true that the old house stood slightly off the perpendicular, and bulged out a little towards the street. Its roof sloped a little to one side, like the cap over the left ear of a Tugenbund student. Its lines wanted accuracy, but, after all, it stood firm thanks to an old elm which buttressed it in the front, and which often in spring sent its young sprays through the window panes. My uncle was tolerably well off for a German professor. The house was his own, and everything in it. The living contents were his goddaughter Grauben, a young Verlandice of seventeen, Martha, and myself. As his nephew and an orphan, I became his laboratory assistant. I freely confess that I was exceedingly fond of geology and all its kindred sciences. The blood of a mineralogist was in my veins, and in the midst of my specimens I was always happy. In a word, a man might live happily enough in the little old house in the Konigstrasse, in spite of the restless impatience of its master, for although he was a little too excitable, he was very fond of me. But the man had no notion how to wait. Nature herself was too slow for him. In April, after he had planted in the terracotta pots outside his window seedling plants of mignonette and convolvulus, he would go and give them a little pull by their leaves to make them grow faster. <laughs> in dealing with such a strange individual, there was nothing for it but prompt obedience. I therefore rushed after him. Chapter 2. A Mystery to be Solved at Any Price That study of his was a museum and nothing else. Specimens of everything known in mineralogy lay there in their places in perfect order, and correctly named, divided into inflammable, metallic, and lithoid minerals. How well I knew all these bits of science! Many a time, instead of enjoying the company of lads of my own age, I had preferred dusting these graphites, anthracites, coals, lignites, and peats, and there were bitumens, resins, organic salts to be protected from the least grain of dust, 
and metals from iron to gold, metals whose current value altogether disappeared in the presence of the Republican equality of scientific specimens, and stones, too, enough to rebuild entirely the house in Konigstrasse, even with a handsome additional room, which would have suited me admirably. But on entering this study now, I thought of none of these wonders. My uncle alone filled my thoughts. He had thrown himself into a velvet easy chair, and was grasping between his hands a book over which he bent, pondering with intense admiration. "'Here's a remarkable book! What a wonderful book!' he was exclaiming. These ejaculations brought to my mind the fact that my uncle was liable to occasional fits of bibliomania, but no old book had any value in his eyes unless it had the virtue of being nowhere else to be found, or at any rate, of being illegible. Well now, don't you see it yet? Why, I have got a priceless treasure that I found this morning in rummaging an old Hervelius' shop, the Jew. Magnificent, I replied with a good imitation of enthusiasm. What was the good of all this fuss about an old quarto, bound in rough calf, a yellow faded volume, with a ragged seal depending from it? But for all that, there was no lull yet in the admiring exclamations of the professor. See, he went on, both asking the questions and supplying the answers. Isn't it a beauty? Yes, splendid. Did you ever see such a binding? Doesn't the book open easily? Yes, it stops open anywhere. But does it shut equally well? Yes, for the binding and the leaves are flush, all in a straight line, and no gaps or openings anywhere. And look at its back after seven hundred years. Why, Bozerian Claus or Polgold might have been proud of such a binding. While rapidly making these comments, my uncle kept opening and shutting the old tome. I really could do no less than ask a question about its contents, although I did not feel the slightest interest. And what is the title of this marvelous work? I asked with an affected eagerness, which he must have been very blind not to see through. This work, replied my uncle, firing up with renewed enthusiasm, this work is the Heims Kringler of Snor Tölsen, the most famous Icelandic author of the 12th century. It is the chronicle of the Norwegian princes who ruled in Iceland. Indeed, I cried, keeping up wonderfully. Of course it is the German translation. What? sharply replied the professor. A translation? What should I do with a translation? This is the Icelandic original in the magnificent idiomatic vernacular, which is both rich and simple, and admits of an infinite variety of grammatical combinations and verbal modifications. Like German, I happily ventured. Yes, replied my uncle, shrugging his shoulders. But in addition to all this, the Icelandic has three numbers like the Greek, and irregular declensions of nouns proper like the Latin. Ah, said I, a little moved out of my indifference, and is the type good? Type? What do you mean by talking of type, wretched Axel? Type? Do you take it for a printed book, you ignorant fool? It is a manuscript, a runic manuscript. Runic? Yes. Do you want me to explain what that is? Of course not, I replied in the tone of an injured man. But my uncle persevered and told me, against my will, of many things I cared nothing about. Runic characters were in use in Iceland in former ages. They were invented, it is said, by Odin himself. Look there und wander, impious young man, und admire these letters, the invention of the Scandinavian god. Well, well. Not knowing what to say, I was going to prostrate myself before this wonderful book, a way of answering equally pleasing to gods and kings, and which has the advantage of never giving them any embarrassment when a little incident happened to divert conversation into another channel. This was the appearance of a dirty slip of parchment, which slipped out of the volume and fell upon the floor. My uncle pounced upon this shred with incredible avidity, an old document, enclosed in immemorial time within the folds of this old book, had for him an immeasurable value. What's this? he cried, and he laid out upon the table a piece of parchment, five inches by three, and along which were traced certain mysterious characters. Here is the exact facsimile. I think it important to let these strange signs be publicly known, 
for they were the means of drawing on Professor Liedenbrock and his nephew to undertake the most wonderful expedition of the 19th century. Runic glyphs occur here. The professor mused a few moments over this series of characters, then raising his spectacles, he pronounced, These are runic letters. They are exactly like those of the manuscript of Snor Tursen. But what on earth is their meaning? Runic letters appearing to my mind to be an invention of the learned to mystify this poor world, I was not sorry to see my uncle suffering the pangs of mystification, at least so it seemed to me, judging from his fingers, which were beginning to work with terrible energy. It is certainly old Icelandic, he muttered between his teeth, and Professor Liedenbrock must have known, for he was acknowledged to be quite a polyglot. Not that he could speak fluently in the two thousand languages and twelve thousand dialects which are spoken on the earth, but he at least knew his share of them. So he was going, in the presence of this difficulty, to give way to all the impetuosity of his character, and I was preparing for a violent outbreak, when two o'clock struck by the little timepiece over the fireplace. At that moment our good housekeeper Martha opened the study door, saying, Dinner is ready. <sighs> I am afraid he sent that soup to where it would boil away to nothing, and Martha took to her heels for safety. I followed her, and hardly knowing how I got there, I found myself seated in my usual place. I waited a few minutes. No professor came. Never within my remembrance had he missed the important ceremonial of dinner. And yet what a good dinner it was. There was parsley soup, an omelet of ham garnished with spiced sorrel, a fillet of veal with compote of prunes, for dessert crystallized fruit, the whole washed down with sweet moselle. All this my uncle was going to sacrifice to a bit of old parchment. As an affectionate and attentive nephew, I considered it my duty to eat for him as well as for myself, which I did conscientiously. I have never known such a thing, said Martha. M. Lidenbrock is not at table. Who could have believed it? I said with my mouth full. Something serious is going to happen, said the servant, shaking her head. My opinion was that nothing more serious would happen than an awful scene when my uncle should have discovered that his dinner was devoured. I'd come to the last of the fruit when a very loud voice tore me away from the pleasures of my dessert. With one spring I bounded out of the dining room into the study. Chapter 3. The Runic Writing Exercises of the Professor Undoubtedly it is runic, said the professor, bending his brows. But there is a secret in it, and I mean to discover the key. A violent gesture finished the sentence. Sit there, he added, holding out his fist towards the table. Sit there and write. I was seated in a trice. Now I will dictate to you every letter of our alphabet which corresponds with each of these Icelandic characters. We will see what that will give us. But by St. Michael, if you should dare to deceive me... The dictation commenced. I did my best. Every letter was given to me one after the other, with the following remarkable result. M M dot R N L L S E S R E V E L S E E C capital I D E S G T S S M F V N T E I E F N I E D R K E K T comma S A M N A T R A T E capital S S A O D R R N E M T N A E capital I N V A E C T R R I L capital S A capital A T S A A R dot n v c r c i e a a b s c c r m i e e v t capital v l f r capital a n t v d t comma i a c o s e i b o k e d i i capital i when this work was ended, my uncle tore the paper from me and examined it attentively for a long time. What does it all mean? He kept repeating mechanically. 
Upon my honor, I could not have enlightened him. Besides, he did not ask me, and went on talking to himself. This is what is called a cryptogram, or cipher, he said, in which letters are purposely thrown in confusion, which, if properly arranged, would reveal their sense. Only thinks that under this jargon there may lie concealed the clue to some great discovery. As for me, I was of the opinion that there was nothing at all in it, though, of course, I took care not to say so. Then the professor took the book and the parchment and diligently compared them together. These two writings are not by the same hand, he said. The cipher is of later dates than the book, an undoubted proof of which I see in a moment. The first letter is a double M, a letter which is not to be found in Turleson's book, and which was only added to the alphabet in the 14th century. Therefore, there are two hundred years between the manuscript and the document. I admitted that this was a strictly logical conclusion. I am therefore led to imagine, continued my uncle, that some possessor of this book wrote these mysterious letters. But who was that possessor? Is his name nowhere to be found in the manuscript? My uncle raised his spectacles, took up a strong lens, and carefully examined the blank pages of the book. On the front of the second, the title page, he noticed a sort of stain which looked like an ink blot. But in looking at it very closely, he thought he could distinguish some half-effaced letters. My uncle at once fastened upon this as the center of interest, and he labored at that blot, until by the help of his microscope he ended by making out the following runic characters which he read without difficulty. On Socknusum, he cried in triumph, why that is the name of another Icelander, a savant of the sixteenth century, a celebrated alchemist. I gazed at my uncle with satisfactory admiration. Those alchemists, he resumed, Avicenna, Bacon, Lully, Paracelsus, were the real and only savants of their time. They made discoveries at which we are astonished. Has not this Socknesem concealed under his cryptogram some surprising invention? It is so. It must be so. The professor's imagination took fire at this hypothesis. No doubt, I ventured to reply. But what interest would he have in thus hiding so marvelous a discovery? Why? Why? How can I tell? Did not Galileo do the same by Saturn? We shall see. I will get at the secret of this document, and I will neither sleep nor eat until I have found it out. My comment on this was a half-suppressed, Oh, nor you is a axle, he added. The deuce, said I to myself. Then it is lucky I have eaten two dinners today. First of all, we must find out the key to this cipher. That cannot be difficult. At these words I quickly raised my head, but my uncle went on soliloquizing. There's nothing easier. In this document there are a hundred and thirty-two letters, viz. seventy-seven consonants and fifty-five vowels. This is the proportion found in southern languages, whilst northern tongues are much richer in consonants. Therefore, this is in a southern language. These were very fair conclusions, I thought. But what language is it? Here I looked for a display of learning, but I met instead with profound analysis. This Soknesem, he went on, was a very well-informed man. Now, since he was not writing in his own mother tongue, he would naturally select that which was currently adopted by the choice spirits of the 16th century. I mean Latin. If I am mistaken, I can but try Spanish, French, Italian, Greek, or Hebrew. But the savants of the 16th century generally wrote in Latin. I am therefore entitled to pronounce this, a priori, to be Latin. It is Latin. Yes, it is Latin, my uncle went on. But it is Latin confused und in disorder, pertubata seo in ordinada, as Euclid has it. Very well, thought I. If you can bring order out of that confusion, my dear uncle, you are a clever man. Let us examine carefully, said he again, taking up the leaf upon which I had written. Here is a series of one hundred and thirty-two letters in apparent disorder. There are words consisting of consonants only, as N-R-R-L-L-S, others, on the other hand, in which vowels predominate, 
as for instance the fifth, U-N-E-E-I-E-F, or the last but one, O-S-E-I-B-O. Now this arrangement has evidently not been premeditated. It has arisen mathematically in obedience to the unknown law which has ruled in the succession of these letters. It appears to me a certainty that the original sentence was written in a proper manner and afterwards distorted by a law which we have yet to discover. Whoever possesses the key of this cipher will read it with fluency. What is that key? Axel, have you got it? I answered not a word, and for a very good reason. My eyes had fallen upon a charming picture suspended against the wall, the portrait of Graubin. My uncle's ward was at that time at Altona, staying with a relation, and in her absence I was very downhearted, for I may confess it to you now, the pretty Verlandes and the professor's nephew loved each other with a patience and a calmness entirely German. We had become engaged unknown to my uncle, who was too much taken up with geology to be able to enter into such feelings as ours. Graubin was a lovely blue-eyed blonde, rather given to gravity and seriousness, but that did not prevent her from loving me very sincerely. As for me, I adored her, if there is such a word in the German language. Thus it happened that the picture of my pretty Verlandes threw me in a moment out of the world of realities into that of memory and fancy. There looked down upon me the faithful companion of my labors and my recreations. Every day she helped me to arrange my uncle's precious specimens. She and I labeled them together. Mademoiselle Graubin was an accomplished mineralogist. She could have taught a few things to a savant. She was fond of investigating abstruse scientific questions. What pleasant hours we have spent in study, and how often I envied the very stones which she handled with her charming fingers. Then, when our leisure hours came, we used to go out together and turn into the shady avenues by the Ulster, which went happily side by side up to the old windmill, which formed such an improvement to the landscape at the head of the lake. On the road we chatted hand in hand. I told her amusing tales at which she laughed heartily. Then we reached the banks of the Elba, and after having bid good-bye to the swan, sailing gracefully amidst the white water lilies, we returned to the quay by the steamer. This is just where I was in my dream, when my uncle with a vehement thump on the table dragged me back to the realities of life. Come, said he, the very first idea which would come into anyone's head to confuse the letters of a sentence would be to write the words vertically instead of horizontally. Indeed, said I. Now we must see what would be the effect of that, Axel. Put down upon this paper any sentence you like. Only instead of arranging the letters in the usual way, one after the other, place them in succession in vertical columns, so as to group them together in five or six vertical lines. I caught his meaning, and immediately produced the following literary wonder. I love you well, my own dear Graubin! Exclamation mark. Good, said the professor, without reading them. Now set down those words in a horizontal line. I obeyed, and with this result... I Y L O A U L O L W R B O U comma N G E V W M D R N E E Y E A exclamation mark. Excellent, said my uncle, taking the paper hastily out of my hands. This begins to look just like an ancient document. The vowels and the consonants are grouped together in equal disorder. There are even capitals in the middle of words. Und commas, too, just as in Socknusem's parchment. I considered these remarks very clever. Now, said my uncle, looking straight at me, to read the sentence which you have just written, und with which I am wholly unacquainted, I shall only have to take the first letter of each word, then the second, the third, und so forth. And my uncle, to his great astonishment, and my much greater read, I love you well, my own dear Graubin. Hello, cried the professor. Yes, indeed, without knowing what I was about, like an awkward and unlucky lover, I had compromised myself by writing this unfortunate sentence. Aha, you are in love with Graubin, he said, with the right look for a guardian. Yes, no, I stammered. You love Graubin. 
he went on once or twice dreamily. Well, let us apply the process I have suggested to the document in question. My uncle, falling back into his absorbing contemplations, had already forgotten my imprudent words. I merely say imprudent, for the great mind of so learned a man, of course, had no place for love affairs, and happily the grand business of the document gained me the victory. Just as the moment of the supreme experiment arrived, the professor's eyes flashed right through his spectacles. There was a quivering in his fingers as he grasped the old parchment. He was deeply moved. At last he gave a preliminary cough, and with profound gravity, naming in succession the first, then the second letter of each word, he dictated me the following. M M E S S V N K A capital S E N R A period I C E F D O capital K period S E G N I T T A M V R T N E C E R T S E R R E T T E comma R O T A I S A D V A comma E D N E C S E D S A D N E L A C A R T N I I I L V capital I S I R A T R A C capital S A R B M V T A B I L E D M E K M E R E T A R C S I L V O C capital I S L E F F E N capital S N I period. I confess I felt considerably excited in coming to the end. These letters named one at a time had carried no sense to my mind. I therefore waited for the professor with great pomp to unfold the magnificent but hidden Latin of this mysterious phrase. But who could have foretold the result? A violent thump made the furniture rattle and spilt some ink, and my pen dropped from between my fingers. That's not it, cried my uncle. There's no sense in it. Then darting out like a shot, bowling downstairs like an avalanche, he rushed into the Konigstrasse and fled. End of chapter 3